Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this brief ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Our last three days are kind of summed up here in terms of total accumulated precipitation, and a lot of what we got over in parts of the eastern United States has been from this cutoff low that's kind of sat right in through here and is slowly moving toward and through Illinois today. Heavy rain on the eastern side of this year, as you can see some locations easily topping uh, six inches of total rainfall in parts of the Tennessee Valley, getting up to the Appalachian Mountains and down toward the Gulf Coast. We've also begun to see the moisture spreading out ahead of a very strong branch of the jet stream coming out of the southwest that will eventually this weekend emerge here in the northern plains as our first of three separate systems we're going to be talking about. Just taking a look at some satellite imagery here as the sun's setting in the eastern part of the United States, you can see where that cutoff low is currently spinning through this part of Illinois, continuing to put down some locally heavy rain. And as a consequence, there's been a pretty broad area in through here where we have just chased a lot of farmers out of the fields for harvest right now. There's a tropical disturbance that's sitting off the coast here that's going to supply some moisture into the Carolinas. It's got an update there. Uh, and that's going to be um, a source of that moisture, like I said, to add increased rainfall to the Carolinas. But it's the strong winds you see screaming across the southwest right here that we're going to be watching most carefully because those winds are a part of a much deeper trough. So here it is. Our cutoff low is in place here. We have one trough that is there. There's a second one here and a third one, a much deeper one, a longer wave here in the um, over the Aleutian Islands. And what's going to happen is the lead wave is going to get up into the northern plains by this weekend. It's going to be followed by a second wave that's going to emerge on the back side of this in the southern plains early next week. And we do have a severe weather threat out ahead of that one we're going to have to talk about. And then finally, this much longer and deeper wave will come right here and set up over the Great Basin and emerge in the central plains midweek next week and that one's going to be a pretty sizable system to be dealing with. So let's get started here with what we've got going on this afternoon. Let me take you back to the beginning of this animation. Here we go. So through this evening what we're going to be watching is that cutoff low slowly moving toward the Great Lakes. We still have rain through the Appalachian Mountains down toward Georgia. And you can see some of the showers still moving through parts of southern Canada excuse me, and uh, here in North Dakota. But that area is going to get quite wet here as we work our way into Friday evening. So I just blasted through Friday right there. You can see the push coming out of the Great Basin right toward the Dakotas, and there it is. Now my concern as we get into the day on Saturday is that we could see Saturday afternoon and evening some strong to severe storms in this region, but you're going to see the circulation begin to set up as this Lee cyclone takes shape. And as we mentioned, here is that potential tropical disturbance right here. If I go back and forth, you'll see it kind of spinning around possibly adding some heavier rains here into the coast as we get into Sunday. Now that's just the beginning of this. If we look at all of it and put it together, remember we have the first wave right here that's coming out on Saturday into Sunday. The second wave here which emerges Sunday night to Monday and then the third big one coming in like this. So they're all kind of crossing over the Great Basin here in the four corner states. But the map I drew this on shows us the probability of getting an inch of rain through the next 10 days. And that's going to be quite wet here in parts of the northern plains getting into Ontario. And this is a place where we don't need this rain right now uh, given harvest efforts in this area. Same thing for this part of the Corn Belt and actually just stretching down here into the southern plains as well because some of this is going to be coming in the way of severe weather. Now, that area in the Southern Plains, I know we've got harvest efforts going on right now, but it's an area that we've seen drought expand over the last month or so. And this is just our latest drought monitor update here. And it mimics some of the soil moisture maps that I do send out in my morning reports here, kind of giving you an idea about where things have been getting drier. But the big story is this. Over the next week, we are going to continue to see this feature, not just the week, the next 10 days, deep troughs of low pressure de developing here. And I'm all the way out there to the 17th. Now, this was a time period where I thought we would lose this signal by breaking down this bigger ridge. But the reality of it is the pattern seems to persist. And I'll give you a good example as to why I think that's the case here in a few moments. But it does make some of my earlier hunches toward the second half of October uh, not looking so great in terms of a forecast. But watch this. Let's go back. As we play through Friday and get into early Saturday morning, this is the wave here that started off off of California. And the one that you've got here began life right there, just to kind of the north and west of Washington. Now, the lead wave comes out. This is the one I'm watching for the strong to severe storms on Saturday night. And then the second wave here, we're going to watch on Monday, early next week, for producing strong to severe storms in the south. Then the much deeper trough digs in by next Tuesday, and it ejects into the Central Plains by Wednesday. And the issue with this trough not advancing is that the size of this ridge is giving us a negative tilt to the trough. So the flow is coming around it like that, sending these lows to the north, not to the east. 
And until these troughs take on a different tilt, and yeah, I thought last Thursday they would have, until they do though, we won't get this pattern to progress forward. So let me show you where we ended up. Yeah, we do have a system coming through, you know, the 16th, 17th here, but it's not. This is just not connected to deep cold air. Notice that? Because there's a ridge here. The coldest air is back in this area, and that's where the trough reestablishes itself, right back to where we began on this animation. So to show you this all take place, why don't we just flip over here and look at our multi-model analysis. Let's go back to the beginning here. This is getting through Friday into Saturday. And let's just pause it right here, Saturday evening. So what we've got, oops, let's shrink that, there we go. What we've got on the left is the GFS and on the right, the European. And about the only differences you're gonna see is that the GFS, which has a known uh, progressive bias, which means it moves weather systems too fast forward, um, it's just gonna do that here. But both models see the same thing. By Sunday, there it is. There's the moisture from the tropical system I talked about. Here's the low that's emerging in the northern plains by 7 p.m., excuse me, on Saturday. This is Saturday, not Sunday. As we play towards Sunday, now this is Sunday morning, afternoon, and evening, you just notice that already the GFS is much further along than the European on the placement of that low. And you're going to continue to see that because as we go into Monday morning, Monday afternoon, what you now notice is that, in fact, let me just take you back here. As this wave emerges, GFS, 1 a.m. on Monday morning central time has the low here. European has it closer here over the um, Red River Valley. And therefore, that system in the GFS is going to advance quicker. See it coming through the western and central corn belt here. And that's going to push through uh, the upper Midwest, getting into the Great Lakes states by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And I'm sure your attention's drawn back farther to the west where we got mountain snow here and some higher elevation snow in, in Wyoming and, and in Utah, both models. And as you can expect, the GFS brings that wave out sooner. This is 1 a.m. Wednesday, still not over the mountains here in the, in the European. And then the GFS by 1 p.m. Wednesday has the low over Iowa and the Europeans got it hanging back here in Nebraska. So you can see the progressive difference, the European being slower than the GFS. But they both still have the same wave. And you can see as I rock back and forth between Wednesday and Thursday of next week, it moves in the same direction, just the timing's a little different. All right? Behind it, thankfully, for a little while, things try to slow down and cool down a little. Well, I'll talk about the temperatures in a minute, but maybe just stop with the really aggressive development of these lows. But with the deeper trough developing off the west, we're going to be bringing in week two much above average precipitation for the western United States. And I'm going to show you that in just a few moments. First, let's do a little comparison here. There's the European model through the next seven days, all right? And here's the GFS. And at first glance, I go back and forth here. These two models have really, you know, overall see a pretty similar picture, but the differences are right here. Remember the greens and blues are where the European is wetter than the GFS. If the GFS is wetter, it's down here in these warmer colors. So the big differences I notice is with the tropical system coming into the Mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas. The first system on Sunday here, um, Sunday to Monday that's hitting, uh, excuse me, the second system, Sunday to Monday that's coming into Oklahoma and Texas. And again, that's our severe threat area. And then with the backside of that deeper low, the third one here, the European is much more aggressive on the rainfall totals and the snowfall totals on the western side of that. Take a look at this. This is the European model solution for total snow through next Thursday night. And we can see in Wyoming here, but in the central Rockies, potential here for some heavy snows in this area. Don't look at this for amount, we're looking at this for placement. Just wanna keep you aware of what's going on there. Now it wouldn't really matter which model I look at when I look at the ensembles for week two, as they're telling the same story. By Sunday the 17th, our deeper trough is reestablished. There's a ridge in the midsection of the country. And you just notice it doesn't break that feature down. So we keep developing Gulf of Alaska troughs. And the result of that, well, we could look at the GFS first, okay? That deeper trough here, wetter Northern California, wetter than average in the Pacific Northwest. And until it moves inland, we'll be drier in the interior. And the European week two says almost the uh, same thing, almost identical forecast here. So what about temperatures as we get toward the end of this video? Our last seven days has certainly been extremely warm in central parts of North America. As we look at this temperature forecast going forward, take a look at this. There's Thursday's highs. And as we go into Friday, I mean, just a heat wave in the midsection of the country while the west is quite cool compared to average. By Saturday, this I think will be the worst day for the southern and central plains, even parts of western Corn Belt. We're looking at temperatures that are 15 to maybe up to 30 degrees warmer than normal. 
I mean, you can see mid to upper 90s here in Kansas. But that fades, thankfully, by the time we get to Sunday into Monday and Tuesday. And as the deeper trough next week really fully becomes established in the west, now this is when it's snowing here, okay, we do see a much colder than average conditions there. How long does that last? Well, if we just go out here to the day 5 through 10 time period, we do see the progression of that colder air into the central United States, but that big ridge downstream is just blocking things up here, and it just won't let go. And this is an area that I, I really I just missed in the forecast. And one of the big things I missed was this. You see, I made a case that if the MJO, which is seen in the forecast of these squiggly lines here, okay, if it were to come out more firmly into phases six and seven, especially phase seven, that's correlated with a cooler central and western, or excuse me, central and eastern part of the United States. But the NGO, MJO, excuse me, kind of failed to do that, and it just is going to collapse back into null space, which means we lose the connection with the tropics here influencing the jet stream pattern, and it's just not there. So as a result of that, well, we, we go back to our other main driver, which is the La Nina. And I want to give a couple of comments on this La Nina. It's stronger than I thought it was going to be. Southern Oscillation Index is at 10 right now. But the extent of that cooler water in the Southern Hemisphere, plus this in here, we did not have this last year. And I expect this La Nina to continue to strengthen on strong trade winds for the next few months, probably through January, even early February. It might peak out in January or early February. And that's going to influence our near-term and long-term pattern. So let's now look again at that time period of mid-October to mid-November. About the only changes here, because the models are favoring persistence, you've heard me say that a lot this late summer and early fall, is that they're just keeping the warmer bias east and north, but it's not quite as warm as it was. And the west is now substantially cooler. It's also kicking the precipitation pattern down the road as well. So with the deeper troughs off the coast, we're wetter here in the northwest in Northern California. And as a, each of these waves tries to eject into the central United States, we're going to get more closer to near normal uh, rainfall in the midsection of the country, which means harvest windows won't be as wide open as we'd hope through the next 30 days. But I'm going to finish with the long range. So take a look at this. December, January, February, new model data here from the European just came out uh, on the 5th. We see here that the extent of the warm anomaly forecast has now moved farther to the north than what it was previously. And we've also gotten considerably wetter. Uh, now we see that it's California, Texas, and possibly along the Gulf Coast that could see a drier winter. Much more active Ohio River Valley storm track and also a uh, Colorado low storm track. And the Pacific Northwest stays wetter as well. Um, changes here, just want to remind you of something. This is all a seasonal look, a three-month average we're looking at. Just remember the sub-seasonal changes in things like the MJO or the polar vortex or the Arctic Oscillation or the North Atlantic Oscillation. They're going to give us a lot of week-to-week -week variability. We're basically just trying to boil this down into a, a broader picture. And my concerns are going to be over California and Texas primarily in terms of drought development this particular winter. And we'll keep an eye on that, see if it verifies. Maybe the most important graphic is the last one I'm going to show you, and it's this one right here. Latest European model forecast for Nino region 3.4, that is the central equatorial Pacific, now has the strength of this La Nina by the time we get into January down at an anomaly, a negative one degree Celsius anomaly. Previously, we thought it was going to be about a half to a, a quarter of a, or three quarters of a degree. And you may ask, well, what's the difference? The difference is substantial when you're talking about several million square kilometers of open ocean. So slight changes in temperature have huge effect. But take a look at this. By next spring, we are forecasting that we'll be out of this La Nina, possibly heading into El Nino territory. And that could have huge implications on the 2022 growing season. So I'm going to keep watching this, analyzing it, and I'll kind of report to you with time what that could mean. So we'll wrap it up here. Have a good rest of your week and weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday. Thank you.